Director, Superior College of Labor and Corporate Studies, Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry. Feature speaker, Mr. Bakarani. Trade union officials and your membership. Faculty and staff at CCLCS. Students of CCLCS. Members of the media, specially invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am a member of the faculty, I am Corinne Gregor, and I am attached to the Labor Studies Department. This evening, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the CLR James Auditorium. We are under the directorship of Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry. Our Labor 2018 public forum will be launched. We are here with purpose as this evening proceedings represents the launch of the Elmer Francois Institute for Research and Debate. The inaugural lecture would be presented by Mr. Bakareni. It is guaranteed to be stimulated and packed with mature, clear, and critical thinking, and even a bit of entertainment. So I ask you to help me to begin this evening's proceedings by welcoming the director, Dr. Andrew Vincent Henry, to deliver the director's address. Thank you, Corinne. It's less a director's address and more a warm and heartfelt welcome. This afternoon, this evening's uh, session is extremely Im important for me um, because it marks an interesting statement on behalf by the college in restating what we see as our role in contributing to the conversation and to the dialogue and indeed the debate for the development, the social and economic development of Trinidad and Tobago, and the empowerment, particularly, of working people. I want to start by acknowledging the contributions of my colleagues, and I want to start by acknowledging the contribution of Mr. Atkins Vidal, who, without hesitation, accepted the imposition to be the coordinator of, the, of, of this center. Um, those of us who know Atkins know him as a particularly driven person. And sometimes in driving, he has no problem in running over anyone who is in the way of the focused mission. And sometimes that is the kind of attitude and that is the kind of drive that we need. So my brother, thank you. Thank you very much. But I'll tell you a story. Atkins is really the alter ego of Ian Daniel. So Ian is the good cop, and he pushes his little brother in front to take all the blows and to take the risk. But the, the, the vision and the consciousness for something like, the, like this institute, it was Ian pushing. And so I thank you also, my brother. <laughs> this concept of a Center for Debate and Research was launched initially some five years ago with the very pretentious name, Center for Intellectual Debate. I don't know if they realized that it was CID. And um, I don't know that we particularly wanted somewhere called CID. Those of us who are of a former time know what the initial CID stands for. And while we wanted to investigate, we really didn't want to macro anybody's business. We wanted to make sure that we were establishing a platform 
by which we can contribute. And it was in that context that we explored a renaming of the center. And we thought that we could do no better recognition to the struggle of, of women and the continuing struggle of women in contributing to the development of our society to name it after the, one of the heroines of the, um, of the struggles of the 1937, 1930s. And for those of you who don't know, because there really isn't that much written about Elma Francois, and the thing that, that strikes me with a tinge of pain is that she was taken far too early, 48 or something like that. She was taken far too early. And when you trace where she came from, from the, a plantation in St. Vincent and the contribution she was able to make, um, I think it is, a, it is a fitting honor. And it is also a dedication for a renewed focus, as I said, on the contribution of women to the development of, the, of working people and to the development of the society. I know some of my female colleagues will say, hey, you're only saying that. But so far, you only recognize two of your brothers. <laughs> but be that as it may. So I am really very pleased to be here this afternoon. And I want to acknowledge uh, Brother Booker Rennie. Um, Booker is another very generous soul has accepted our invitation to be part of what we call our Council of Elders. And that's not because he is a demonstrable eminence gris with his gray beard, but because he has a, a major contribution to make. And he, too, is one of, of generous spirit. Um, and you will forgive me, I have to give one pecong, one pecong this afternoon. And that is for my comrade in arms from the, um, my days in the students' movement some almost 50 years ago. This victory that was delivered in the industrial this afternoon for workers' rights. Ian, if Mr. Duke's here clapping, he will not be happy. <laughs> so, Vincent, congratulations. But having said that, I am really looking forward to hear about Nello, and I think there's no one better around to tell us that story than Booker. Dr. Henry, thank you for your welcome. And with that, we are going to be prepared to open the Institute. The Institute is the Elma Francois Institute for Research and Debate. Elma Francois, a leader, a world-class intellectual who understood the struggle for development, a woman who was able to internalize the struggle from the perspective of the region, from the perspective of country, but also from the perspective of the household and of the average citizen. She embraced the struggle, the struggle and she stood trial. Like many men of her time, she defended herself, but with her own words. I quote, I don't know that my speech creates disaffection. I know that my speeches create a fire in the minds of people so as to change, as so as to change the conditions which now exist." End quote. As such, I would, like, I would now like to call on Mr. Akins Vidal, the coordinator of the Elma Francois Institute for Research and Debate, to formally present and open the institute. understand how important it is for us to have these discussions while these issues are on the table. And our panel included President Vincent Cabrera, our own Ian Daniel, and Mr. Jared Pernard, who presented the position of the business community. 
who presented his IR, his position on IR, how he saw it, and it was opposed to the position that the other panelists had, and that is okay. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing as academics and intellectuals. We're not supposed to be afraid of the other side. We're not supposed to be afraid of engaging dialogue with persons who hold a different view to us. Because we have to be confident that we could win based on the strength of our argument, if I'm right. But if someone presents an argument that is stronger than mine, as far as the rules of critical thinking go, I have to change my position. So, how do you grow if you stay and confine yourself to spaces where everybody's saying exactly the same thing? How do you grow as a person in a space like that? How do you learn in a space like that? Where everybody around you tells you exactly what you want to hear? Not possible. So I'm saying to you all now that as we progress, we're going to have some panelists who are going to raise some eyebrows and people are going to ask what he doing there or what she doing there. And that's all right. Because again, it is important for us to have as wide a range as possible for us to be able to learn. And it's debate. It's research and debate. If your idea is that good, then debate it. Yeah? And have confidence in the positions that you put forward. So the skeleton that we've devised is that we'll have a coordinating committee at the center. And there are several components that will make up the institution. One, our Council of Elders, which the director spoke to. We've already had several sessions. We've had a session with Mr. Rennie himself very early on. We've had a session with Mr. Basdeo Pandey. And most recently, we've had a session with Professor Redock and a truncated session, very truncated session with Dr. Suzanne Craig. And why is this important? This is important because as lecturers, as academics, it's important for us to move out of the books and to speak to people who have been on the ground in the vineyard, so to speak. Because we need to ensure that when we deliver our material, especially in an institution like this, that we are relevant have to be relevant. And so these sessions are important. And what this will also do for us is this will guide us in terms of the overall work that we have to do. So in the session with Mr. Pandey, for example, he asked us a very important question which we have to work out as a college. And he asked, what is the role and function of the college? Is the college to produce, supposed to produce good workers or are we supposed to focus on happy workers? Right? The two might not be mutually exclusive, you know, but in the environment in which we live in this country, some people will make you believe that they are. So happy workers are unproductive slackers, yes? Think about that a little bit. The question of research is also important. Now, this is going to be a challenge for us because we don't as yet have um, facilities like those on the bench with sabbaticals and so on because it is very difficult for academics to do research and write while you're fully employed <laughs> teaching. Okay, it is nearly impossible to do that. So, those are, so when we talk about producing written work from, from our lecturers, we're going to have to have a little talk with the director and the board and, and the ministry and so on about um, sabbaticals, because we're going to need to give people the time that's required to write properly. Right? So, but for now, we, we'll write in, in, in the newsletter as much as we can. So there are several aspects to this research. One, institutional research, which will, which will be research initiated by the college, and this research will be published primarily by the lecturers. The second kind of research would be research requested by stakeholders. So from time to time, uh, different stakeholders, be it students, be it organizations, um, the ministry, they will come to us and ask us to look into particular things. And that will also be an aspect of the research that we will do. Research requested by external entities, the general public. So what happens if a company comes to 
to the college and they say, listen, as hypothetical as this is, we really want to try a different approach to how we engage our employees. What can you do for us? How can you help us with this process? We don't understand this industrial relations thing properly and we don't want to make any mistakes. Will the college say, no, well, as a company, we're not interested in discussing anything with you? Can't do that. We can't do that. Academic conferences will be another basis for research. And let me say now that we have already started the gears turning for our first academic conference on labor studies in March of 2019. It will be a regional conference. We expect as well that we may get one or two international speakers. But it is high time that we recognize that there is enough work done in labor and corporate for us to be able to discuss these things in an academic way. Because it was when we define those things, then we could go out into the public and discuss them. But we have to make sure that the academics is solid. All right? The academia has to be solid. A second aspect, or rather a third, is outreach. I'm a historian in training. And one of the things that I was asked early on when I started to get into history is, so what do you plan to do, teach? Because you know you can't do anything else with that. Now, there's a debate you get into about how important research is generally. And if you're a good researcher, particularly trained in research for history, how versatile you can be. But my response was simply this. Yes, I will be a, a teacher, and I'll probably spend 40% of the time in the classroom teaching and 60% out in the public teaching. And that's what we also have to do as academics. Teaching is not just about the classroom environment. We have to go out there. We have to get involved in our communities. And I gave up a lecture for a tutor district on Saturday gone. And that was the point that I made to them. Because they were saying they don't get any support when it's time to march and protest and so on. And I said, do you go out and speak to your neighbors? When, you, when you're building up to this point where you have to protest and you have to make sure that your neighbors and your neighbor's child is going to have to stay home because you are not at work, do you know who that neighbor is? Can they refer to you by name? And if they can't, then you can't be surprised that there's no connection to your action. So we have to go out and we have to meet people and we have to meet people where they are. And academia has survived for millennia with people teaching at formal institutions and teaching in informal institutions. So us going out into communities is not going to shut down the college. In fact, I'm almost certain that if we roll out our enrollment planning at the community level, we could see something very different happening in September. Right? Just a suggestion. Education and training. And I spoke to some of this, but this comes now with us tailoring programs for our organizations, our credit unions, our trade unions, and even the business class and the government ministries. And that is also important because, again, as an academic institution, we have to see the value in sharing a particular type of philosophy with the broadest audience possible. The last aspect will be a moot court. Now, our moot court is going to be modeled after the industrial court. Let me say we already have a draft, and we hope that we can kick off a pilot in the next academic year. We eventually would want it to be a module for students, a year-long module, where you can practice. So it will not just be the theoretical work of how the industrial court works, but you will actually practice with your props and everything. And this will also give us an opportunity to engage in debate using this forum. Let's have the secondary schools come and debate. Let them tell us what they think company versus union looks like. Let them tell us what they think we look like. What is their perception of us? Because you see it when you have the parliamentary debates. You see how those students, what those students think of our parliamentarians. So let's see what they think of us. And those things are important because it opens an avenue for us 
for regional collaboration because they labor colleges throughout the region. And one of the, two of the strongest are very close to us in Guyana and in Barbados. So it opens real possibilities and opportunities for us. So we see this as a, a very, very important aspect of the work to be done. We'll also have, and going forward on Wednesday, so I'm inviting you now to come back on Wednesday, and of course thank you for coming out this evening, but we're not done with you yet. So Wednesday we'll have a panel discussion, labor confronting the challenges of the 21st century. And we have a very uh, competent panel to deal with that, because one of the things we have to do is we have to look forward all the time. Right? We have to look forward. So I want to stop there, because I know that I've probably gone just about two minutes over my time. Uh, but I want to say again, thank you to all of you. Um, this is an important exercise. This cannot be a one-person show. If Akins Vidal has no support, this will not work. This will fall down completely. So far, that is not the complaint. All right, so far that is not the complaint, and I'm very happy about that. Um, and anyone who was left in the week, we will double back and pick them up and move forward with them again. Um, arms akimbo, yes? So thank you again, everyone. So we now declare the Institute open. Everyone, everyone is, a is a believer. Let the, Let the powers, powers of belief work, work for you and, and start, start believing in yourselves. We live in a world where different colors and cultures help to form this lovely rainbow we call belief. And through the caves of time, many have tried to uncover the secret beliefs of kings, high priests, and thieves. This mystical power was used as a psychological curse. It wasn't for belief, we may not have been part of this universe. It's because of belief, Adam and Eve were created and placed in the garden. Because Lucifer believed he was greater than God, he was expelled from heaven. You see, it's a strange day. A strange thing or don't you know that everybody believes in something and they believe that yes something is the right thing oh yeah oh yeah everybody believes in something and they believe that yes something is the right thing some believe in prayers and fasting, faith and meditation. While some believe in the evil doers, the psychic and opium man. Every day, people believe in something new. But you must always believe in you, in you, in you. You got to always believe in you. You gotta believe in yourself each and every time. We live in a time when man defies the limits of logic. In his quest for an advanced civilization. And in his thirst for this illusion he calls perfection. His destructive demise seems more certain than the sunrise. Now he believes that war is going to bring him peace. And as a result, nuclear threats never seem to cease. Because of Hitler's beliefs, history was written with the ink of blood. Shim Jones and Corish beliefs stained many with a mental mud. You see, it's a strange day. A strange thing, or don't you know that everybody believes in something? And they believe 
that there's something is the right thing oh yeah oh yeah everybody believes in something yeah and they believe that there's something is the right thing some have killed and will give their lives for their belief in religion while some got shot for their beliefs with an automatic gun cause every day people believe in something new but you must always believe in you in you in you you got to always believe in you in you in you believe in yourself I would like to thank the organizers of the Elmer Francois Institute of Research and Debate for inviting me here to be part of this occasion. As you all know, Calypso is also about research and debate. And by Calypso, our stories are told. So I want to give you some short stories about the stories of Calypso from my perspective. Let's go. This is an everyday story. I want to know right now. I'm asking this question. Where will it end? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. What's just it like again today? Just returned from a funeral. Another life is lost at the hands of a criminal, Lord. I always thought of crime as someone else's worry. I never thought there'd be a time it would come and confront me. Now some complaining about state of emergency. But like we head so far up, we see this country in that state a long time already a state of excuses a state of confusion human rights abuses and third world illusions it didn't take no more to spree to stop the alarm for me lord when will it end shrimp mango was like a starch mango so sweet no fear grips or hearts just to stroll down the street I know I can't be as it was before but oh, 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 I can't take it no more When will it end? Cause every day is a mother shot Somebody dead oh. And every day is a gun shot boy Somebody dead Tell me what did the headlines say? Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Oh. I'm this question. In desperate times, we need desperate measures. If if you could reduce crime, I'll give up many pleasures. The critics say the government, they don't know what they're doing. But then the same critics say the same government have to try and do something. Now some complaining about police brutality. But like we head so far up, we can't see sometimes the police simply performing their duty. But we're a state of Lacure, a state of Bacchanal, where we live life every day like it's a carnival. We always walk quick fix. Sometimes I think we, we skip no friendly God. When will it end? I agree, there are officers who cause in us grief. The atrocities they do are still in disbelief. Now we can't tell the difference between police and thieves. A rock standing in the anal in his report. When will it end? Well, every day is a mother, Lord, somebody dead. And every day is a mother chop, somebody dead. You know why? Because the 
Corruption so high, we can't get over it. Corruption so low, we can't get under it. Corruption so high, we can't get around it. Corruption so deep, we so deep, can't get so deep. It. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. That's what we face every day. Now, by Calypso's, our stories are told. Where from? Let's go. I want to give you a story from 2010. <laughs> but the story seems to be the same in 2018. So I want to share this story with you. What is happening to Sweetie and T? Ask them boys in Parliament for me. Education is indeed a golden rule, but not to make you become a politician fool. Next election, I'm telling you flat, I want a candidate who don't like her butt. I will campaign till the very end for somebody who can't come from one to ten. Cause them fellas, they bright. They do right, and that is why they now run this country. Go my gracious the bright for spite, and that is why a country facing this plight. They see in bright with the 2020 vision, but go see people live in a 1920 condition. So much vagrants in this city. They could easily overthrow the Chinese army. So you see, we build a great bit of wall to ensure that Obama and see the squalor at all. So for me, there is no other answer. You know what? It's best we elect a stupid prime minister. Cause them fellas, they. Good God, eh? Cause we're not on the country, right? I want to take you to 20. 12 and we're going to do this one in a symphonic style I visited Parliament Chamber Witness an orchestra, a band, band, band of only politicians. Well, rated their performance on style, talent and endurance. A band, band, band of parliamentarians. The orchestra. Politics that encourage hate, making good folks discriminate. Bridge is replaced by gates. Nurturing racism, prejudice and tribalism, multiculturalism. Mama gives harm from the UNC and the PNM and the COB and the political sin, 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 up. So picking it cool, don't be paid for a fool. They use the race as a tool to divide, conquer, and rule. To justify their bull, the race card they always pull. Up, rock, up, rock, up, rock. Up, rock. It's time to up, rock. Now, I'll be leaving in. Nine days for a tour of the United States. I don't want to do this song, you know, but I may have to sing this song for them. Let's go! It's about Trinidad and Tobago, Sweet Sister Summer. Let's go! Welcome to my island home, beautiful place I call my own. Welcome to my island home. Beautiful place I bought my own yeah, yeah, coconut water Sarsaparilla We are sweet brown sugar ah. We have some people who pocket fat While some people like sewer rats Selfishness, all face green citizens can't get Basic needs like healthcare in the red 
spine and surgery Kill is your dead, your sick no bed The rest your head in labor You'll strike at this dead People see it stress in so many ways Can't get water for days Eight and nine year old getting brains By ten becoming strays in a glee both we independent and free Lord of Axin, how could this be? When more than 90% of you and me we, we are free from poverty We are free from poverty But every time we're born here, you know what? Yet we live in here, we should sleep With people full of water Sarsaparilla We got sweet brown sugar Murder, violence and crime Citizens can't get peace of mind You die a nine, nine, nine Grace of time Mama tell them kiss with the sun Though justice completely blind Defense and politician Wine and crime No cent, five cent and no dime Give them dollar, dollar, dollar And the super fine How are you? Future of the country Cocaine hooks up like lagly Reduce them to vagrancy Not to mention HIV While some study and earn a degree Frying chicken for KXC Some turn to banditry To support the family You know why? Plague in illiteracy This is still not in Tobago Many of them make it back for tea With the coconut water Sarsaparilla We got the sweet brown sugar I want you all to sing something for me Let's go! Then, we said then, we said then, oh Then, we said then, we said then, oh Then, we said then, we said then, oh Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the program. Let's go. For the man of the moment, I invite Mr. Bokarani to give us his discourse entitled The Man Called Nello Perspectives on CLR James. Good night to the audience. It's an honor for me to be here at the Elmer Francois Institute for Research. And it's particularly an honor for me because of my involvement in resurrecting, resurrecting Elmer Francois's whole involvement in the 1937 and 1938 struggles. I remember when I first did that and I published that speech that everyone quotes today, I remember the criticism I got from a number of people was that I was somehow attempting to belittle the role of Butler in the 1937-38 struggles. And in fact, one headline was, who is the heroes of the 1937 struggle? Surprise, surprise, according to Bukharedi, it's the Negro Welfare Association. Elmo Francois, Jim Barrett, Bertie Percival, and a number of those other people to whom I was introduced to by none other than Mr. Lennox Peer. And I took the time to sit with these people, to do the research, went to the libraries and dug up all the information that I could get on the Negro Welfare Association. As I was saying to the chairperson of the proceedings earlier today, one of the things that struck me with that Negro Welfare Association was the fact that they were all workers. Workers, actual workers who had a certain amount of intellectual prowess that did not exist nowhere else at that time. And they were able to give a certain kind of direction to the struggle then that I thought was quite remarkable. And I, I thought it needed to be, that story needed to be retold. Um, one of the things that happened as a result of what I did in publishing the, the story 
was that they found themselves suddenly being revisited by people from all over the world. I remember Mr. Barrett telling me, he said, boy, you don't know what you have done. You have given us our life again, our political life again. So that was important to me, for me. And um, I must thank Lennox Spear for having introduced me to, to, to Jim Barrett, who in fact revealed the entire story to me. So now that I stand here at the Elmer Francois Institute for Learning, I feel honored. CLR, to start with him, I can only start at the beginning. CLR was born in 1931. And one of the things that we will note in his speeches delivered nationally as well as internationally is that attempt to paint a very particular portrait of his immediate family, his father, his mother, his grandparents on either side, as well as that of their friends and the people with whom they readily associated. He talked incessantly about these people being quite adept as teachers and social activists, how well-read they were, how informed they were of world affairs and their grasp of all the great modern literary classics to which at a tender age he was overly exposed. Some readers have expressed the view that CLR in this regard was being quite boastful. But the point that he was vividly making is that these quite remarkable people could only have achieved so much through only, though only a generation away from enslavement, precisely because of the stock of humanity from which they sprung. These African West Indian Sierra argued were civilized people as you will find anywhere in the world, and that it was an egregious fallacy to assume, as did many, that they had to come to Britain or go to Europe to be civilized. Of course, such pronouncements were made to counter the nonsense spouted then by people such as Professor Harlan, then based right here at ICTA, and the Professor J. Froud of Oxford University, both of whom promulgated that African people were intellectually inferior and were unable to govern themselves. And while J.J. Thomas took on Professor Fraud in his well-known work titled Fraudacity, CLR in like manner dealt with Professor Harlan in a critique titled The Intelligence of the Negro. But unfortunately, this latter work is not well known and I recommend it to you. It was published in the New Beacon in 1931. Strange enough, I recall that the, in UWE, there's a Harlan Society still existing in the a Faculty of Agriculture, named after the same individual that CLR took down in the 1931 for saying that, the, that Africans are inferior. Needless to say, Sierra took on all such negative assumptions about African people very early in his career as writer and orator, mindful that all people possess within themselves a vision of their own wit and their own greatness out of which they are able to establish their legacies. Sierra was the first to destroy the myth that the enslaved Africans came to the Caribbean without any cultural manifestations. CLR, CLR said boldly, without any fear of contradiction, that we, the enslaved Africans, came with ourselves. Four words. We came with ourselves. Those simple four words changed the entire perspective. It meant that the spirit and the soul embedded in your person are more reflective of culture than any material artifacts. In other words, it is the human mind, the capacity to comprehend, construe, and extrapolate phenomena that best exemplifies culture, quote unquote. Ciela quoted Richard Parry's Merchants and Planters, a study of the Caribbean sugar industry published in 1960 by Cambridge University, and I recommend that to you all. He quoted that to show that the enslaved on the sugar plantations who, ha who handled the process of producing sugar 
Besides being cane cutters, had in a, in a way to be engineers, chemists, quality control officers, etc. In fact, an army of specialists, quote unquote, to make the production process work. The fact that the enslaved Africans were capable very quickly to master the socialized organization of a modern production process, farming, factory, and shop floor relations, was indicative of who they indeed were when they were brought here in chains and bondage. In recent times, there has been on it further evidence from records of white US slave masters that supports this view and indicates clearly that some plantation owners in Virginia stipulated in advance to the captain of slave ships exactly from which area of the African continent they desired enslaved human beings relevant to their rice planting, propagation, irrigation skills, as well as their propensity for handling machinery. For more on this, I recommend the book Slaves in the Family by Edward Ball that was published in 1998. CLR also quoted from Lejeune's History of Barbados written in 1653, in which document it is reported that the enslaved from the very onset began seeking to establish their own, quote, freedom and make themselves masters of the islands. In other words, from the very beginning of their existence, within socialized sugar production, they were a people imbibed with a certain spirit of combativeness and a high level of social consciousness. On the basis of such social and political consciousness, Sailor argues that the decades after emancipation in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and moreover the 1870s, 80s, and 1890s were replete with building agitation throughout the Caribbean for basic reform and even bold alluding to home rule at the turn of the century. It followed logically, therefore, that by 1932, a person such as CLR at the age of 31 could have left the Caribbean region for Britain armed with the manuscript on the life of Captain Cipriani, three chapters of which were later published as the case for West Indian self-government, and the novel Minty Ali, in which he painted life in the barricades of TNT to underscore the strivings and stirrings of the common folk for modern democratic existence. In England in the period 1932 to 1938, besides being a mesh in cricket journalism and in debating ongoing political issues, he joined first the International Labour Party, the ILP, a faction of the British Labour Party, and he wrote extensively for their newspaper, Controversy. There are two newspapers, The Controversy and The New Leader. But due to differences that arose therein, he became a part of the Trotskyite Revolutionary Socialist League, a faction within the ILP, and edited their organ workers' fight. Despite, despite being Im immersed in British working class politics, the Caribbean and Africa remained fully in his mind, and together with his childhood friend, George Pardon, the International African Service Bureau was established to inform, promote, and assist anti-colonial struggles throughout the African continent and the Caribbean. Yet CLI was extremely prolific in terms of what he accomplished with his research and writings in this period. Bobby Hill of Jamaica Reserve Authority on the life and activities of CLI James describes it best in the following manner. Quote, by anyone's standards, it was a monumental achievement which staggers the mind simply in the recounting of it. In order that the full study of James's actual accomplishments may be settled and recognized from the onset, from the outset, it would be best to simply itemize them. And the list runs as follows. 1932, The Life of Cipriani, published for the West Indies. 1933, the case for West Indian self-government on a bridge version of the above. Three, Larry Constantine's Cricket and I, 1932, which James was largely responsible for writing. Minty Ali, 1936, the novel. Five, the International African Friends of Ethiopia, that period in 1935 to 7, that promoted the international solidarity for Ethiopia against 
Italian aggression. He was very much involved in that and writing for, for about that. Six, to send over to the play that a lot of people are not aware of, in which Paul Robeson played the leading role in the London production in 1936. He also edited the International African Opinion in 1938, the official organ of the International African Service Bureau that was part of the organization formed by him and George Patmore. Eight, the first historical account of the Third International, World Revolution, 1917 to 1936, the rise and fall of the Communist International, 1937. Then the eighth, ninth, was the English translation of Boris Sovereign's bio biography, Stalin, in 1938. He translated that from French to English. Then 10, the Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture, and the San Domingo Revolution in 1938. And last of all, a history of the Negro Revolt in 1939 that was later reprinted and published as Pan-African Report. 11 major pieces that man accomplished in the period 1932 to 1938. And whilst he was doing all the research for that, he was also debating, writing for the newspapers, covering cricket and whatnot. As a spokesman and a noted orator on international political issues, Cela became so, f so favored that he was invited in 1938 to the USA by James Cannon of the American Socialist Workers' Party, an arm of Trotsky's Fourth International, to engage in a lecture tour. There's a suggestion posed by one analyst that Cela was part of the British, that Cela, who was part of the British delegation for the founding conference of Trotsky's Fourth International in France in 1938 was lured by Kieran to the US as, quote, a guise to rid the British Trotskyists of a troublesome element. And that had to do with his criticisms that he did in the fall of the Communist International that he published. CLR stayed in the USA for 15 years until he was threatened with deportation back to England in 1953 after being incarcerated on Ellis Island in 1952 for his political activities. His sojourn in the USA brought a close-up scrutiny of the leadership of the Trotskyite Fourth International and a direct involvement with the struggles of black workers and white workers in the modern factory plants across the USA. The dynamics of the practice therein would lead CLR to new theoretical formulations that brought eventually a complete break with Trotskyism. There were two major issues involved with this break. The first major reason for the break concerned the question of the nature of the Russian Soviet state. Trotsky remained firm in his view that the Russian Revolution of 1917 was hijacked by the Stalinists after Lenin's death in 1923. In his view, the Soviet state after 23 became a degenerate worker state, quote unquote, managed by the Stalinists who were an aberrant, corrupt bureaucracy above the workers in production. The extension of this logic was that once the Stalinist aberration was removed, the workers' state, as established in 1919 by the Bolsheviks, led by V.I. Lenin, would once again flourish and quickly reposition itself in time as a beacon to the working masses of the world over. In fact, Trotsky was adamant that the Stalinist bureaucracy would come apart at the seams in the course of the impending World War II and that the progressive Russian workers would quickly reassert their power and lead the workers of the world in solidarity against all imperialist and nationalist agendas. The war came and lasted from 1939 to 45, in the course of which Trotsky, in, a, in exile in 1928, was eventually assassinated in Mexico, allegedly by agents of Stalin. But the fact that the very opposite of all that he, his political prognosis was saying be, did not or become a reality through Trotsky's international party into serious disrepute and disregard and disarray. disarray. This, so it was out of that that CLR pulled a group of people together and the Johnson Forest tendency, which I will refer to as the JFT from here on in. 
the key people in that group was a woman by the name was CLR who wrote under the name J.R. Johnson. Raya Dunya Yevskaya, she wrote as Freddie Forrest. And another lady by the name of Grace Lee. Raya was a Ukrainian, a Jew Ukrainian who migrated from Ukraine to the States, became a social activist. And while Trotsky was in, in Mexico, she functioned as his personal secretary. She heard Sierra put forward his arguments against the Fourth International and, and his proposal for the struggle of black workers in the States, and she immediately joined Sierra. The other person was Grace Lee. She was the daughter of Chinese immigrants. She had a PhD in philosophy. She could speak both French and German, as well as Raya, who could speak Russian. So they were very helpful in, in the work that CLI was able to do in terms of researching what was happening in the Russian situation at the time. There are three key documents published in this period by the JFT, written largely by CLI, of course, with the inputs from Raya and Grace. The first was the balance sheet, an assessment of the revolutionary Marxist organization in the USA, published in August 1947. The second was the invading socialist society that advanced the view that the existing communist parties throughout the world were not merely the tools of the Kremlin, but were organizations reflecting a specific tendency given the mode and the then stage of capitalist development internationally and outlined strategies to combat that. The third document was Notes on Dialectics, which, which comprised mainly of letters written by CLR to other members of the tendency elucidating and clarifying the Hegelian dialectic. Ciela went back to Hegel to show how the thought process can become fossilized, how people can come to think in solid categories and so prove unable to conceptualize and perceive beyond absolutes and the old forms. Ciela demonstrates in this document the human mind in action, how human thought is supposed to relate to actual concrete development on the ground how there's affirmation in every negation, and how every negation in turn comes to be negated. And he shows how the Russian Revolution was destroyed not only by the low level of the productive forces, the meager development of the market forces and modern relations, given a basically feudal Russia, but more so by the fossilized thinking of even those who were well-intentioned. Particularly someone like Trotsky who equated nationalization and nationalized property with socialism. And CLI will say that Trotsky took one moment in the course of struggle to build socialism and made it a universal absolute. absolute. Trotsky died with the view that the corrupt Russian bureaucracy had by necessity to revert to private property. And his followers and apologists would later extrapolate from this that since there was no private property in Russia, there could be no capital, and therefore, by extension, no capitalism. Of course, given what has since become economic reality, no sane person will argue. Uh, thank you. Even the democratic centralized vanguard party as organized and first perfected by Lenin in the Russian experience stood to be negated according to CLR's understanding of how phenomena develops, grows, and becomes obsolete. CLR was quite clear when he said in Notes on Dialectics that there is no fear whatever that the proletariat will not form a party. The question in 1948 is what is the character of the proletarian party in 1948 and from that standpoint, CLI will proceed theoretically to re-examine the notion and essence of party and mass movement and the relationship between these two organizational concepts. For such an approach as posited way back in 1948, CLI in the 1970s and 80s will be lampooned throughout the Caribbean and elsewhere by the Stalinist and Maoist types as being anti-party, anti-organization, and an advocate of pure spontaneity. The Johnson Forest tendency had its ups and downs. At first, breaking with the Socialist Workers' Party to operate within a splinter called the Workers' Party, but after a while went back to the 
WSP only to break completely with Trotsky, Trotskyism in 1950 when a full and comprehensive position on the Russian question was published under the rubric State Capitalism and World Revolution. I recommend that to you. In which CLR examined the greater depth, the then prevalent tendency of capital on both sides of the world to move towards further and further depersonalization, concentration, and centralization, i.e. state capitalism, and how the working masses were self-organizing within production without any vanguard structures above them. The, the Johnson Forest tendency had hammered out a different vision that served to signal the turning point in the understanding of 20th century modern politics. CLR was clear that politically the world in which we live began in 1917 with the Russian Revolution and that all fundamentally new directions would by necessity flow directly out of the experiences of that major social political event. The other major issue that CLR took up with Trotsky and eventually broke on was the question of an autonomous program for Afro-American working class struggle. When the proposal was projected in April 1939 during discussion with Trotsky in Moscow, the general perspective of the fourth international membership was typical of the old school Marxist ideologues who maintained that the agenda for all forms of struggle had to be subjected to the overall program of the Socialist Workers' Party of America. CLR saw no difference in this approach to that of the Orthodox Communist Party. CLR explained, quote, Independ the independent Negro struggle has a vitality and a vitality of its own. It is not led necessarily by either the organized labor movement or the Marxist Party. Yet it exercised powerful influence on the revolutionary proletariat and is a constituent part of the struggle for socialism. But most of all, the struggle in the southern states of America is not merely a struggle of the Negroes for human and civil rights, but, quote, a struggle for the reorganization of the whole agricultural system in the U.S. CLI was adamant that the interrelationship of the various sectors of the proletariat added dynamism and intensity, which furthermore pushed the independent Negro struggle into the vanguard of the proletarian movement. CLR scientific positions on the Afro-American struggle not only presented difficulties for the orthodox left in their practice, but as well revealed a fundamental flaw in the Trotskyite methodology. But CLR could have advanced those views not only based on his philosophical view of history, but also based on his organization's work and their direct contact with shop floor activity across the USA. By the 1960s, some 12 years after such independent programs on the part of, of Afro-Americans would become the order of the day. However, once CLR posited this argument, the underlying logic of it soon thereafter had to be extended to include all the other various sectors and segments of the mass movement. It meant that the women, students, unemployed, loping period, because of their particular experience as fragmented as a fragment in those crystallized segments of the population, each had a specific unique relationship to capital and defined by distinct subcultures could no longer be merely seen as potential workers or workers between jobs, but had now to bring, and were in fact bring in, their own specific and independent demands to the common table. There is nothing in political history not in political philosophy and methodology that indicates that only advanced workers can trigger revolutionary situations. See, we have said that. Therefore, the true vanguard party for the times would have to reflect all these legitimate independent demands, agendas, and programs structurally and coordinate the leadership of all the various sectors. In this regard, Sela will insinuate that the, the Trotskyites remained one-dimensional in their strategy and approach. Moreover, they were ultra-mechanistic in their conception of the so-called Vanguard Party with its preordained plan that disregarded the specific 
variety of the various sectors of the mass movement. In other words, the times demanding now a vanguard entirely different in structure and nature. One commentator suggested that CLR throughout his long life, quote, manifested an abiding faith in democracy and saw a revolutionary politics as means towards the deepening of the democratic process, unquote. But many today may be, may be prone to disregard revolutionary politics as pathways to democracy. In similar context, many today will be astonished to read what CLR had to say about Christianity and how he placed that in historical perspective. This is what he said, quote, abstract universality was established by historical Christianity which superseded the Roman Empire. Christianity united all men before birth in the universality of original sin, and after death in the possibility of universal redemption in heaven. It was the religion of the millions who had been released from slavery by the collapse of the Roman Empire. The narrow, straitened circumstances of their material lives were compensated for by the subjective conception of an afterlife in which all their material needs would be satisfied. Or better still, there will be no need for material satisfaction at all. But extreme abstraction though it was, man is for the first time established as universal man. He added further, the outstanding feature of the contemporary world is that the principles for which Christianity stood in its best days are now regarded as a matter of life and death by the average workers. The whole history of civilization and Christianity consists in the concretization of the values proclaimed so abstractly by Christianity. Once the human personality had arrived at the stage of theoretical equality, the further progress of civilization is to be judged by the degree to which this equality is outlined. So what did CLR then propose? Should an organization in today's world be doing? He says, an, quote, an organization today of whatever kind has to understand that it hasn't got to teach the masses anything. What it has to do is to recognize that leadership has always existed under all forms of society. You have to take up any old book, the Bible or anything, and understand that the creation of a body of leadership for a specific task is a natural human result of human intelligence and human association. That is no problem. What the organization has to learn is to be able, in 1964, to see and understand the socialistic and revolutionary instincts that exist in the population, the resentment, the desire to overturn and get rid of the tremendous burden crushing the people. In other words, it is not so much to be concerned with educating the masses. The masses don't need education at all, absolutely none. The organizations, the leadership, is they who have to educate themselves. He said, this is not a simple matter, but it has remained obscured and neglected, or neglected too long. The dialectic is a theory of knowledge, but precisely for that reason, it is a theory of the nature of man. Hegel and Marxism did not first arrive at a theory of knowledge, which they applied to nature and society. They arrived at a theory of knowledge from their examination of men in society. Their first, their first question was, what is man? And what is truth about him? Where has he come from and where is he going? They answered that question first because they knew that without any answer to that general question, they could not think about particular questions. Man is not only what he does, but what he thinks and what he aims at. But this can only be judged by the concrete, what actually takes place. The truth is always concrete, but this concrete must always be viewed in the light of the whole past, present, and future. This is the essence of dialectic, according to CLR. I want to sum up. It is necessary to make the point that CLR's political thought cannot be dealt with in piecemeal fashion. Every facet fits a coherent whole. 
The history of the world for him is the history of the mass of humanity struggling for a better life and for further democratic rights and to establish the broadest democratic institutions possible at any given stage. As he said in Dialectical Materialism and the Fate of Humanity, man struggles to become complete. The history of mankind is one coherent story with certain areas of the world taking up the leading mantle at certain times. For CLR, democracy with a capital D signifying a perfect system does not exist. The world has only known tribalism, communalism, feudalism, capitalism under which slavery and indentiture flourish and state capitalism in various degrees and under varied disguises, but nevertheless, capitalism in its most modern, global, monopolistic, and brutal form. The eternal quest for democracy is the one true historic tradition of all humanity struggling for self-determination, empowerment, and completeness, the single most coherent tendency of the masses throughout all the systems the world has known. However, modern capitalism claims democracy with a capital D for itself, and as if synonymous with itself, as if to suggest we have attained the be-all and the end-all of human endeavor for a more fulfilling existence. Modern capitalist society is not synonymous with democracy. In fact, the reality is quite the opposite. Yet it is certainly not strange that after global capital brought the iron curtains down, when the USSR was dismantled and all the artificial subjective barriers were removed, revealing to all and sundry what we always knew, that there was only one world economy, American politicians and, philosoph philosophical, and philosophers alike hustled to advance the view that ideology and class struggle had come to an end. CLR's analysis and political insights debunk such vacuous arguments. If to him the events of 1917, the Russian Revolution, shaped the world of the 20th century, shaped the democratic quest and tendencies of the 20th century, then the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, when workers opposed to state totalitarianism actually took over the production process as well as political governments, albeit only temporary, will likewise shape the tremendous democratic possibilities for the 20th century and beyond. Now that is CLR. He was end up on Ellis Island because being in the States, went across the electorate tour and faced with the McCarthyite era where all these people, all the, the, the FBI were investigating people and coming up with all these charges against people who were supposedly Marxist and communist. CLR was constantly under the gun. Hence the reason for the J.R. Johnson, the, 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 the fictitious name. He got married a woman by the name of Constant Webb, that was his second wife. His first wife was a Trinidadian, Juanita Young, and that, that he married in 1929, and that, that marriage collapsed when he left for England. Constant Webb heard him speak, and Ciela had, had this ability, you know. My friend here could bear this out. Ciela will walk into a room and start a talk, and he had this way of saying what he came to talk about, what he will not talk about, what he will talk about and for how long he will talk. And you will see the time now is so, so, so. I will talk for exactly half an hour. And he will wind up in, in those 30 minutes saying exactly what he proposed to say. My friend here could tell you that he was part of that. Another thing about CLR is that a lot of people who attended classes with CLR in, 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 in metropoles in Montreal and in London will tell you if the classes were supposed to start at 4 o'clock and 4 o'clock, nobody was there, he started by himself. And people will walk in and meet him already reading and talking, you know? But it was a, a, a reflection of the man's commitment, and he was an organizer. And I, if you take one thing from me today, it is this. CLI was an organization animal. Everywhere he went, he attempted to build something, an organization. And he had a way of seeing and doing in terms of how he put 
these structures together and how we engage people. One of his famous um, statements was um, Sagage Pis on Va, which he used to tell us, let us engage and we will see. He had taken that from, from Napoleon, who he said was one of these great military generals, and see, uh, he always said that Napoleon had this basic position, that he will engage in a war with somebody with a basic plan. But the idea is really to, not to go with that with a fossilized idea where that is a absolute. You go with that and then you engage and you see. So engage peace on fire. So you engage with this and then you see and then you move to suit. And Sheila showed that in all his organizations that, that, that he formed and the same thing happened when he came to Trinidad and he was invited here in 1958 by the Lord Hills, the Governor General of the Federal for the Federation. And he came and he was offered secretary to be the secretary of the Federal West Indian Federal Labour Party. He took up that and of course that gave him the opportunity to go right through the West Indies talking about Federation. And he was very clear on certain things. He was clear, he said to me that Federation is the only means through which this colonial thing could be transformed into genuine independence. Without Federation, it's nothing, right? And he said that when the, the, he, 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 that he had a nice way of saying this thing, he said the, the, the people in Guyana, when their, their constitution was suspended in 1957 by the British, the rest of the Caribbean didn't rally them. He said that is where the Federation should have started. Then, then is when it should have started in a practical effort in support of the Guyanese people. You know, and he, he said, you know, there was a, a hostility to the, to the federal sentiment that came largely out of Guyana and, and, and Jamaica. And he said, what, what both Chedi Jagan and, and, and um, Buster Manti should have done is get a constituency assembly of the, of the Federation of the West Indies together and pose all your position, pose your position and pose your options. He said, well, that was never done. And he said the plebiscite that was held in, 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 in Jamaica was a fraudulent plebiscite, right? But when that collapsed, and you know, he, he, he talked about Williams in regard to that federation. He said that Williams was pushed by the people of Trinidad. Again, what he's saying is that the people are, so not, and this is not intellectuals, these are people who are demonstration, demonstrating by their action where they want to go. And he said Williams was talking about getting the, the capital of Chagra, the to be the capital of the, the Federation of the West Indies, and the people wanted that, and they came out in the march, the march for Chagaramas. In 1960, 50,000 people was on the street. All the trade unions was there. I think the only two trade unions that didn't support was um, CSA, civil servants, because at that time they was upset with um, Lee, with the Lee. Event. Remember when uh, Ulrich Lee had made proposals for, and give them a $5 increase? <laughs> and, and the sugar union. But all the other unions associations was out there. Janet Jagan from Guyana, she came and addressed the, 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 the march. And of course, the betrayal began. Rather than marching down to Shagaramas, they marched them around to go back to the square and whatnot. But the point about it, the spirit and everything that was there was clear. You know, and we and CLI said that, and he wrote that in, 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 in when you think that you have P and M go forward, that was how it was first published, and then party politics in the West Indies. He thought it was the weakness of the of, of, of the people who were leading the thing, and it was it never amounted to to be much. It was never more than a glorified crown colony. And Williams himself, in, in if you read in one hunger, you will see he agreed with that too. He said that in the end, after all, he tried to get um, Adams and, and Manley and them to move. All of them wanted to have veto power 
on the central federal government, especially in areas where you're dealing with things like income tax, industrialization, freedom of movement, and whatnot. So the question is that if, you, if each one of these entities in the territory, you want, you're talking about a federation or a central federal authority, but you don't want to give this, the, the, the federal authority any serious power, wasting time. So Williams and all, had, in the end, had to, had, 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 to, had to think, you know. So the point is, here he was in the Caribbean, and Williams talked about CLR as being, you know, it's interesting. It's very interesting, you know. There's a document called Perspectives for the Party that you all should read in which Williams talks about the party having two leaders, a political leader and a theoretical leader. And he identified it. He said the political leader will deal with the day-to-day -day politics and will deal with setting the, the stage for social attitudes and whatnot. But the theoretical leader is the person who will bring the ideas and the inspiration. And then he says that, um, it, it don't have to be this one person, you know. It does not, this may not be embodied. Those two roles may not be embodied by one person. It could be two or three persons. Obviously, indicating to the people in the party that here was a man, CLO, who would be a theoretical leader. Eh? This is why I keep telling, I tell people there were two icons in the PNM. CLO and Williams were the two icons. They led the struggle for the, in, in trying to get the federation. When it failed, he stayed in the West Indies and, and took over the, 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 the role of editing the newspaper, the nation. And he did a, a listen to what CLR says about Williams. I have known Dr. Williams since he was about 10 or 11 years old. I taught him. We played cricket and football on QRC teams. He followed me as a lecturer in English and history at the Government Trading College. He spent his holidays from Oxford in London with me. I read with him Aristotle, Hobbes, and Rousseau. He, Hazley Makshan, and I spent a fabulous holiday at Nelson in Lancashire with Larry and Norman, Norma Cousin Tantine. He spent days in Paris with me working at the Black Japo bins. We spent countless or was discussing West Indian history and history in general. I read various drafts of the thesis which became capitalism and slavery. It so happened that he came to America a year after I did. He used to come to New York and stay with me. I used to go to Washington and stay with him. We constantly exchanged facts and ideas about all sorts of intellectual subjects. When distance separated us, we arranged to meet once for a few hours in Paris, once in Salt Lake City for two days. Because of this common background, I talked to him more easily and with quicker mutual understanding than with anybody I know. <laughs> However, CLR's contribution in, to capitalism is well known. What seems to be little known is that likewise CLR had, in, Williams had inputs in, CL, in CLR's Black Jack events. That came out recently with the publishing of the CLR with the um, Black Jacobins reader. Charles Fosdick and Christian Hogsburg quoted CLR saying, Williams covered a lot of work for me. He is a wonderful man at research collecting information and putting it in some sort of order. And there are certain pages in the Black Jacobins where most of the material and all footnotes are things that Williams gave to me. I never had occasion to look them up. All right? So here are these two fellas. If you read the, 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 the statement that Williams gave to the fifth annual convention, you will see where he talked about CLR's work as editor of the nation, 
it is serious work for independence. It is not, it is, uh, he say, that is giving the nation, the, the PNM newspaper, a voice in the outer world. All right? But what is going to happen is that one is going to move. You have two icons. One is pushing, talking about building a party with a mass democratic content. And one who eventually talking about building a party, consolidating power in an executive. Right? There's a document. At this com what I just explained to you there is part of the dynamics of the PNM. And this is what caused the eruptions from time to time, even at general council level. There's a document called the Party in Independence that I found. It's produced in 1964 by a special committee of the PNM General Council. I want to read this. I want to read this for you. And I want to take time reading this because I want you to understand what this see. This is 1964. CLR has been expelled. They came up with the fact that, that they said misappropriation of funds. But I believe that that had to do with the publishing of, the, of, the, of, of modern politics. When CLR realized the, the, that he was under pressure and that he, his days were coming to an end within the PNM because he couldn't get the leadership to deal with what he was proposing, to build the party in along certain lines and to, for them to take the responsibility for that newspaper, to take it into a daily newspaper. He went to the library in August of 1960 and delivered six lectures. Modern politics? is how it is known. If you go and you Google that, modern politics today, I did it recently, and this is what it's, I found. This volume provides a brilliant and accessible summation of the ideas of the giant CLR James. Originally delivered in 1960 as a series of lectures in his native Trinidad, these writings powerfully displayed his, his wide-ranging erudition and enduring relevance. From his analysis of revolutionary history from the Athenian city-states through the English Revolution, Russian Revolution, and the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, to the role of literature, art, and culture in society, from Charlie Chaplin to Pablo Picasso via Camus and Einstein, to an interrogation of the ideas and philosophy of such thinkers as Rousseau, Lenin, and Trotsky. This is a magnificent tour de force from a critically engaged thinker at the height of his prowess, of his powers. An essential introduction to a body of work as necessary and illuminating for this century as it proved for the last. That is a statement on what Modern politics, the six lectures delivered by CLR, attempting to explain to the people of Trinidad who he was, why he took certain positions, and what he believed in all his life. He took money from the PNM because he was running the press and the plant, and they published, the PNM press published the modern politics. You know what he eventually came of that? Williams sold all the books to a New York book dealer on one condition, that he take all out of Trinidad. <laughs> all. Leave none. All right? But all of that is happening in the 1960s. But in 1964, no, I, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit, because when CLR, CLR left, the party, the general council of that party didn't take that lightly. You know. There was a resolution moved in the convention demanding the reinstatement of CLR, you know. moved by a woman called Yuna Mohammed from San Fernando. When she raised, when she moved that resolution, the whole place applauded. And she got the resolution passed demanding that he be re reinstated immediately. It was never done, all right? But I just want to show you 
the kind of influence that he had. 1964, this is a committee of the General Council set up to do a review of the party in independence. I wouldn't tell you who was involved with that committee. You might laugh. But anyway. Sorry, Michael. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is it. And I, read it, I will read it slow because I want it to sink. The party is for independence and democracy. The party should be unmistakably be in the forefront of the progressive forces in the country. This is the PNM we're talking about, huh? General Council. In its philosophy, the party possesses the necessary equipment to perform this function. The party activists must be conscious of their historic role at the head of the mass movement in every field. Party members should play an active part in these organizations, religious, charitable, and social, cultural, recreational, and well political. Where they choose to do so, we take pains to urge that they must not permit their party allegiance to obtrude. The key is therefore the activation of the party, the translation and evolution of the party from a mere election machine into a social and political force in the community. It is of the utmost importance for the future of the country that the vital decisions should not be taken exclusively by the people who are closest to the seat of power. For there, the fear and the pressure are greatest, and there, the, the judgment is most likely to be affected by transient considerations. The existence of an active, powerful, democratic party close to the, close to the government and the people is the only effective counterpoise to the pressure of sectional interest, the surest guarantee of objective judgment, the most enduring foundation of future stability, and the most potent barrier against the capricious use of power. Let the PDM fulfill its predestined role as the key to open the door of the dynamic and creative energies of the people. In my view, unquote, in my view, that is the clearest perception to be found anywhere in the required relationship between party and government and party and mass movement. To necessitate, to necessitate the leverage of the power of the people over the state apparatus. That powerful statement meant nothing to a lot of people. All right? Celaro came back in 65. That's another interesting engagement. Celaro was commissioned to cover the Australian tour, cricket tour. He came to 65 to Jamaica, fell ill, went back to um, England for treatment, and then landed in Trinidad in 65 in March, I think about the 12th of March. At that time, um, Sugar Belt was in uproar. PNM was rushing uh, 19, uh, the, the, the in ISA, the Industrial Stabilization Act through Parliament. They had support, that support of the official opposition led by Kapil Dev. But at that time, there was a pro tem leader because Ka 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 Kapil Dev was always out. So Steve Maraj was the potem leader, and Steve Maraj broke ranks. And when Steve Maraj broke ranks, you know, I say that is serious politics. And the end result of all of that was the question of the WFP, the formation of first of a, a action committee with people like Lennox Spear and Dubé and Anaman Tudo and all of that. And he says, 
This is what CLR says. 1,500 chiefly East Indian sugar workers have made it quite clear that they wish to form an alliance with the predominantly African ODWT and chase into limbo their Indian leaders. No amount of gossip or complaints of fact or facts can remove that from the front of my mind. That is a tremendous event. It is history, social movement on the grand scale. And look at where it comes from. It comes from below. That is what interests me. Right? And he talks about that. He says, integration is taking place quickly between the ethnic groups, between the races. He talks about the meet in the neighbor in neighborhoods, the meeting around cricket matches, one another, and the fact is there is a common language. So he says he sees no problem down the road. But what he says to the Indian youths, he says, if you want to finish with the old ways, the words that you have to learn are two, party organization. With that, we can conquer the world. Without that, nothing but chaos and disaster. Remember that, party organization. All right? And they engaged. Of course, everybody lost their deposit at the 66 election. I came in, in contact with CLR for the first time at 19, I was 19 years old. I was turned on by the concept of the right of recall. Simple. While listening one night to an old man with shaking hands under a shop in Mount Lambert, I heard the, con and this, the concept of the right of recall, and I went home and took on my entire household with arguments supportive of that civic right of recall, as well as encouraging all and sundry to read the WFP manifesto. How are we to measure the impact of new ideas? Seeds are simply planted and later germinate. There's no way of measuring how far your work will take. Listening to Akins tonight talk about what the plans are, this is what keeps coming through my mind. These little seeds, these little steps, as he said, one step at a time. How do you know where it's going to lead? People say CLR failed, and failed in, when he came back and he should not come and engage with WFP, but the point about it, that was 1966, four years after this whole place was in 1970. So how could you say, how could you say, how could you call that failure? It's a question of the way in which you see development and the way in which you see phenomena. And I say today, if one thing you take from this is that CLI was an organizational animal whose major tactic was sagage puissant va. Engage and you'll see.